So thank you so much for the introduction and the invitation. We're very really happy to be here at the the Beach in this first edition of the Data Science Wrap. Um, so Maria and I are going to talk about the uh, natural language processing uh, where they generate text. Um, so also we're focusing on the customer uh, customer service uh, use case. So um, we've been experimenting with uh, energy uh, methods for some time and we want to share with you the challenges we face and the um, lessons we've learned in case you want to use them for real use cases, which, as I said, can be fun and challenging. Um, first, a little bit about where we work. We work at BBVA AI Factory, which is a company that uh, is a subsidiary of BBVA, uh, the second largest bank in Spain. And we work building data products. So most of the models or the systems that are based on AI are built in our company. Um, we work in multidisciplinary teams, which is now very common in industry, but we've been doing this uh, for many years. We work in engineers, data scientists, uh, art data architects, and business owners uh, all together. And we work in uh, supporting or in three main strategic uh, lines uh, for the bank, for the new, for the UVA. Um, so the first one was um, uh, yeah, uh, financial health. We want to so through the app we uh, there are teams in our uh, in our um, company that are facing uh, <laughs> that provides uh, tips for improving financial health of the clients, like for example account balance uh, forecasting or uh, what recommendations to what to do with your money if you have savings, for example. Uh, the second line is reaching our clients. Um, we have some uh, things working in dynamic pricing and uh, uh, campaign optimization. And the third one is driving operational excellence. We, so there is another team working in anti money laundry. We are starting to work with uh, risk modeling. And the last one is personalized client relationship model. And this is the business area that designs how the bank interacts with, uh, with the clients. And the project we're going to talk about today is uh, this uh, area. Okay, so in uh, the recent years, um, there are more and more clients that are interacting with the financial advisors through the app via text messages. And the number of messages has been increasing for, uh, for the recent months. And in the team, what we're trying to do is to build the systems based on NLP because we're handling text. text that can help or assist the financial managers to reduce their workload, or especially uh, those tasks that are very <laughs> tedious. And well, we, we, we work in trying to help them with, uh, reduce the average response time. So uh, how do we do it? How do we work at uh, a factory? So we have our day-to-day -day work. We work very hard in uh, putting models into production and deploy them in the infrastructure of the bank. Uh, when we talk about NLP models, uh, there are examples that we have already in, pro in production, which is, for example, a text classifier. So financial managers need to tag every conversation they have with clients uh, into a set of topics. So we build a text classifier that suggests a possible tag for each conversation. And this is uh, already uh, deployed in the, in the agency infrastructure or uh, sorry, Interface for the, the building. So we put a lot of uh, a lot of time into that. On the other hand, we also work in innovation projects. So every three months, three months, we test new technology to see if there could be any business case that can be solved with the those new technology of the state of the art, and evaluate whether it can be deployed in the infrastructure, and we experiment a little bit. And uh, this is what we did with uh, natural language uh, processing models that generate text that will go into, into it. Uh, okay. So as I mentioned earlier, the communication with the repeating clients and financial advisors, um, most of it or a uh, big part is through text messages. Uh, since the pandemic, this, the number of messages uh, between the client and advisors has increased a lot, reaching uh, almost one million per month. 
So taking this into account and also the fact that we have historical data of conversations between clients and uh, advisors for many years back, we, uh, this led us to the question um, whether we could build a system that helps financial advisors to uh, answer questions from the clients. And uh, this um, reminds me also to Carmen's uh, talk. We didn't want to build a system or a chatbot that uh, just spits out a, a generated answer to the client. We wanted to be uh, an assistance for the agent or the financial advisor. So the advisor has the end uh, or the final decision on whether the, the answer generated is good or not for, for the client. So this is uh, an example of the prototype that we imagined. Um, so this would be um, a, like a picture of the manager interface. Uh, the manager would receive a client's question and uh, then it would have the suggested answer, which is uh, automatically generated. And then uh, he or she has the option of editing that, uh, that answer or uh, writing the brand new answer with the case knife. They are not uh, happy with it. So, as you can see, this looks like text generation already, and Maria is going to tell you about how this can be performed, text generation. Hi, thank you, Clara. Well, first of all, what uh, natural language generation is. So, as opposed to traditional, let's say, text uh, systems, where we have, um, instead of getting uh, an answer or a text from a set or predefined text, uh, in natural language generation, we have a system that generates text. So, um, for example, let's see the examples. We go to machine translation, we have an input sentence in the original language, and we want to get the sentence or the text to be translated into the target language, right? So, in this case, we don't have a bar with every possible text uh, existing in the world, right? And uh, we want to know to, we want to know to have something that is able to generate this text. Um, and the example, question answer, if we have uh, this paragraph as a context, and we have a good question, in this case, for example, when the VLC start uh, becoming popular, and our, our model uh, would get, uh, generate the exact answer. Uh, another example is organization. Uh, here we have a new, a new document, or a new text, or uh, multiple texts, and we want to be summarized in a more brief uh, our, uh, text. Uh, it can be extracted or uh, abstract in summarization. Um, more recently, we have seen an example of code completion. This is uh, autopilot. Um, and here, um, um, here you have uh, as input text, you can have the function second signature, and the output text will be the actual code of the function, right? It's a, Example of text, text generation, we can have also example of text to text, for example, when we look at all the transcription, or also image to text, when we do caption, we, you, get, um, you get a system, uh, an image, a simple, and the model output the caption of the image, right? So, uh, the, the, the prototype that we are thinking is an example of text to text, we have our, um, we have our input sentence. Uh, the, the customer uh, answer the customer um, question as the input, and we want to suggest the manager uh, the, the, output, uh, the output sentence. Um, okay. Um, here, how, how this uh, model uh, works in general? Well, for translation systems, for example, we fit the, sorry, <laughs> we fit the system with uh, a bunch of pairs of. Uh, sentences in the original language and in the target language, and hopefully our system is able to, uh, to, to learn how to do this translation. In our system, it's kind of the same, we have historical data, uh, more than, uh, as Clara mentioned, more than one message per month, um, uh, one million messages per month, and uh, we fit the system with a pair of actual uh, uh, questions and actual answers, and we can learn how to creates this answer when a new, a new input uh, point comes, right? Uh, okay, this is the general idea of an engine, how this is implemented, or how can we implement it? Well, uh, mainly uh, we are going to be using language models for generative <coughs> What is a language model? 
Mathematically, it can be more, com uh, more complex, but uh, the idea is very simple. A uh, length rule is a uh, probability distribution over a set of words or a sequence of words. So, if I ask you, what's the probability of the cat is brown, how, how likely is this sentence to, to exist in, let's say, our world, versus the cat is blue, I guess most of you, all of you, would say that the probability of the cat is brown is higher, right, than the cat is blue. So that's what a language model does. It, it learns what's the probability of uh, having a sequence of words. But if we have this, we can do a step forward and um, we use language models for saying, okay, if I have this previous sequence of words, what's the most likely word that comes next? Okay, we can, we can go from one to, to the other. So if I say next to me, you, right? So you is the most likely word probably coming here. <laughs> Second example, I tried to read it yesterday, but I, maybe it's not that easy, but probably couldn't, is one of the most likely words. In the last example, my credit card, card is here, we don't have um, just like one key example, one key word that, that is uh, like the top, but probably broken or working or missing is more likely than mala. Right? So that was how the next model uh, learns how, how to compute this probability distribution. And once we have this probability distribution, we just start to generate text. Mm -hmm. uh, well, this is the idea. How can we learn to do this? There are a bunch of, uh, a lot of, uh, let's say, algorithms or approaches. But uh, uh, yes, we have here from the very simplistic uh, probabilistic model based on errors. We can do something more like instead of uh, being the world's uh, independent tokens, we can do a menu, so it's kind of great to create a more dense representation. We can use also recurrent neural networks that to think about the open and the relationship between the words. Uh, here, sequence to sequence is one of those uh, examples, and it's the one we are going to, talk, to be talking in a minute. And then we can have also transformers that is a step forward, uh, like uh, using the uh, first architecture or the uh, free architecture. Okay, so. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Let's get into the what a sequence to sequence is. This is a simplistic representation from a bone. You have two modes, two components, the encoder part and the decoder part. Right? The other part takes the input sentence, in this case, a uh, sentence in one language, in English, and um, the other part learns how to produce the output, the, the sentence in the, in the output system. In this case, it's a sentence in Spice. In our uh, case, it's the same. We have, we have the encoder receiving. We have the encoder receiving um, the, the question from the customer. In this case, I have uh, lost my car. And we want the system to be able to reproduce or to generate an, uh, an answer. It's like I have already requested a one or whatever. So, how. Um, yes. Can you see the. Well, I can explain when you see the answer. Uh, how it works is that uh, you, in the in decoder the part, you start with a start token, you say here the both token, and uh, the model uh, system uh, generates i. You put i as a next token, and now you have. Go i, it generates half, you fit the other code again with the new word, and so on and so on and so on, and that's how you are generating the, the whole sentence. Okay, uh, in detail, what sequence to sequence architecture looks like, something like that. Um, I'm going to try to explain a little bit. Um, as I mentioned, we have the embedding part, uh, we have the uh, encoder and the uh, encoder inputs. This is the architecture for training, right? It's what we are doing our model to, to learn. Um, we have the embedding part that translates these tokens to uh, their representations. We have here, I guess, <laughs> here uh, in PowerPoint, um, um, a sequence of LSTM cells, the hidden cells, which are the, 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 in terms of, uh, um, of getting the relationship between the words and where to the network pay attention and what are the more important words that key that, that gets the key representation of the whole sentence. And uh, we have this thought vector, which is the key in sequence to sequence. You can think of the thought vector as the 
uh, how we condense all the information from the input sequence in, let's say, one, one how we summarize, let's say, the meaning of the input sentence. For example, in translation, it's very, it's very simple to understand. If we say, my name is Maria, and me llamo Maria, uh, they both have the same meaning. So this conductor should, should encapsulate this meaning, right? And once we are able to, to, to condense it, to condense here that this, what's the meaning of this sentence, later we, we just have to produce it in any database, in any, in any tag and names, right? In our case, it's the same. Uh, this conductor should condense what the customer wants on uh, behind. Uh, well, we have the decoder part, which again are a lot of um, uh, any, uh, uh, some NSDL cells that are able to generate these steps, and we have the final sub uh, subpass layer, which is the one that outputs the probability distribution. And there, over there, up uh, is where the loss function uh, gets in, in, enters in, into a house, and we want to the predictive uh, words to be very close to the actual words and we want to minimize these words. Uh, that, uh, there we can see uh, some of the parameters of a uh, network like that, and obviously when you change these parameters, the behavior of the network uh, is, is different, so we that have different uh, ways of uh, the network uh, behavior. Uh, this is uh, the first, uh, some of the first uh, training that we did. Uh, we use uh, 1 million of pairs of questions and actual answers uh, in Spanish. We did the model in Spanish because it's our first uh, language that we have. We have uh, translated here some examples for you to get <laughs> the, the idea, okay? Um, and we took like uh, more or less two years uh, of data. Uh, the preprocessing set is very important in, in, uh, in general in NLP. Here I would like to recall especially the remove ratings and first part because these networks are known to be to be adapted. Uh, they, they have uh, uh, words as much as their sequences are longer. So uh, we try to do the sequences as short as possible. So in our case, we, what we did is like the, the, for, for, for several reasons, there are many times that the managers use like, hi, hi Maria, nice to meet you. Or nice to meet you. Like, hi, hi Maria, thank you for reaching out, blah, blah. So we condense all that in just one token. And that's about uh, doing that, we have uh, much smaller sequences and everything is easier. Uh, and there are, those, you can see some of the, of the parameters that we use. And let's see some examples of how this model behaves. Uh, okay, there is, uh, uh, well, you can see that there is some in Spanish. The idea now in English is that we have a, a in brown, right? We have the customer, the customer query saying, okay, I need to copy my data, what can I do? And this is the actual uh, output of the network. It says, okay, you can go to the BBI page, click on that, and request me one. So this is totally makes sense and looks quite convenient. So sequence to sequence uh, works quite well. Uh, oh, from a point of view. Uh, another example? Yes, uh, it's... Sorry, no spoilers. Uh, it's, a different, it's a different topic, this is a little bit more complex. It's about a group that I see on my, on my bank account, and the output is uh, explaining the charts, why in which, in which my, um, in which uh, shop is for the zone, and if you don't have any other question, if you have any other question, do not hesitate to contact me. So you can see that it also works well with more complex uh, uh, examples. And the last one that I want to show you, yes, is uh, okay, here the customer says, oh, um, I would like to make an appointment with you, uh, this is my, my availability, please let me know uh, when, when you can reach me out. And the answer said, okay, I told you, but I will uh, I couldn't do it. Please let me know any day, a time that suits you, and I will send you. Cheers. Okay, so this is a really good, uh, this is a quite convenient question, but here maybe we are not so sure if it's answering actually what the customer is. Uh, okay, so we have these three examples, uh, but what's, what are the numbers, right? Because if you're going to I'll tell you. 
So yeah, as, uh, as you've seen, uh, to say is spitting out uh, sequences and answers, and to us it was super impressive uh, because it keeps that uh, coherence. But now, how do we validate uh, this? How do we go to the business uh, owners and say, um, well, let's do this? Um, so then it's when we took, uh, like I mentioned, machine learning practices, uh, common practices, we took a training data set and a test data set, and we, uh, as you can see in the, in the graph, we, we validated it. And then we, we saw uh, we saw that we had a 75% accuracy. But at the same time, we started looking at some examples of uh, questions and answers generated, and things started to get a bit weird. Like, for example, in those uh, sentences, uh, there are very different questions, and the answer is always, I try to reach you, but I couldn't, uh, I couldn't uh, talk to you. Let me know when is your available time your available time to, to talk, which is okay, maybe it can suit, but it could work in, in any case, no? So then we, we said, well, what's happening here? Because this accuracy is like misleading, right? And then after this finding, uh, many more questions arise, like, well, so which answers are correct? How many of them? And what do we even mean by correct? And if we want to optimize our network, because we train it with very simple default parameters, um, what metric do we use? Because this accuracy doesn't seem right. So we dig into the literature and uh, the way uh, natural language processing uh, models that generate uh, languages are validated uh, are, usually, are usually two approaches. The first one is automatic metrics, and the second one is human criteria. Um, automatic uh, metrics can help you optimize your network because it's the, like, uh, there is a layer, uh, as Maria explained, that compares the sequence uh, generated and the reference one. Uh, but we need to decide which ones, and we'll get uh, into that a bit later. And the human criteria. So uh, it is recommended that um, um, when evaluating these uh, systems, that the human criteria uh, is aligned with uh, an automatic metric. But, uh, of course, human criteria is case specific, so you need to know what you're dealing with and what your problem is. Um, talking about automatic metrics, uh, there are many of them, and they are usually used or applied in machine translation. Um, there is accuracy, which uh, uh, that counts the number of words that are present in the generated uh, answer and in the reference answer. The reference answer would be the advisor's answer that was actually given uh, in that specific case. And then we have Rouge and Bleu, which are uh, combinations or different combinations of ways of calculating uh, how much um, they have in common, reference uh, answer and generated answer. Um, one, one possible one is uh, what is the longest common subsequence between the, the two. So this is how we could, uh, with one automatic metric like this, uh, we could start optimizing the metric. Um, on the other hand, how do we measure or how, how do we uh, evaluate? So, on the other hand, we have how, how do we uh, validate money? How do we have a feeling of the, what the human criteria is to validate or to evaluate uh, our problem, our problem or our system? There are three things that should be taken into account. Uh, we need a team of uh, people that will annotate uh, or validate this, uh, the answers generated according to what it was given. Uh, there needs to be agreement between the annotators uh, because if, any, if uh, everyone is choosing their own criteria, then what is correct and what is incorrect. Uh, so that's why there should be a lot of discussion between the annotators, uh, especially the first rounds, uh, to make sure that everyone is evaluating the same way. And that's why also it is very important to uh, establish clear guidelines to how we are evaluating. Um, so, we got into this and okay.
So again, we went to the, to the literature, uh, to the state of the art, and, uh, and start digging, uh, well, how is this done? What, what aspects are measured when we want to manually annotate responses or generated text? So in machine translation, uh, adequacy and fluency is important. In summarization, responsiveness, coherence, consistency, fluency, and relevance is important. And in question answering, which is not exactly our case, but it can be related to, um, they usually, or researchers usually choose answerability and correctness. So as you see here, we have to decide. Um, we went for these two, answerability and correctness. So for our specific problem, well, what do we mean by answerability? When can an answer, a question be answered? Okay, so in terms of answerability, can the question be answered? Because sometimes not even a financial advisor can answer the question. Because here we, we count with millions of questions and many also weird things. So after a lot of discussion between the team that we were um, ready to validate, we came up with four uh, possible answers. Yes, the question can be answered with the information that is given in the question with no additional information. This is straightforward. Uh, second, uh, the question needs, so in order to answer the question, we need context from the client. So for example, I've lost my car, I applied for a new one, but I haven't received it yet. So the advisor needs to check whether the card was sent or not, or for example, I got a, a, a charge for a, um, of this amount and I don't know where, where it is coming from. So there is there is need to uh, there is need to check uh, the client's uh, profile or information. And then the third one is no, the question doesn't have enough information to be answered or uh, it doesn't need to be answered because maybe they have just talked on the phone and the, the, the answer is yes or the, the message is yes, thanks for your help. So there's no need for a, for a reply. Um, and then there were some of them that we discarded because they were either too complex or very, very specific questions of a specific clients. So those of them we, we discarded them. So, okay, so we are clear about what answerability means for our problem. Um, let's check what happens with, uh, what do we do with correctness. Okay, so the second aspect we wanted to evaluate was correctness. So, what do we mean by correct? And here, again, we went to the examples, we looked at many, many different uh, examples, and we came up with three groups. The first group is the answer given is correct. So, straightforward. Good morning, I need a new card, but because mine is broken. Good morning, in cases when your card is broken, you can go to this URL, blah, blah, blah. So, this is, um, this is easy. Um, then we had a group of uh, answers that could be correct, or potentially correct, but need some context. So, some, uh, in some cases, they could be correct to be suggested to the advisor, but it depends on uh, that information that we don't have. So, for example, as I mentioned earlier, um, I've ordered a new, a new card, and when will I get it? And the answer, this is an actual answer that uh, uh, was generated. Uh, it says, I have just checked, and your new BBA card was sent last uh, date or week, to your address and shipping takes about seven working days, which means it should be arriving soon. So this can work or not, but uh, there is the need of, of checking where the card is. But still, we, we find it um, um, that could be correct. And the third group is incorrect. No, it's not related to the customer questions, like for example, how can I change my address? And the answer is, there are three ways to change your phone number. So this is not good. Um, so with those three uh, groups, then uh, we established the clear guidance for evaluating correctness. And in this case, uh, if answerability is yes, it can be answered with the information in the question, then the label would be uh, either three of them, those of these. Incorrect, um, correct, and is similar to the actual answer, and to correct, it's better than the actual answer. 
So sometimes we also found that the generated question was not like the one given to that specific question, but it was better because it had learned from other uh, financial advisors and well, this happened and it wasn't uh, two or three cases. And then if the system needs or if there is a need of context from the client, uh, then we would label the, the answer by uh, it can, can it be suggested to the advisor, would it be useful or no? So as you say, this is, as you have seen, this, well, this took a, a long time uh, to actually get to this uh, the, the way of um, evaluating the, the system. So at the second round, we were four annotators and uh, each of us um, labeled or annotated 450 conversations each. And each conversation or each pair of question answer was evaluated uh, by two people. So we could so we could be, we were able to measure the agreement and actually measuring how good our how good our uh, criteria was. So these are the results. Um, after all this hard work, um, what did we find out about uh, answerability? So we found that 56% um, of the questions needed context from the customers, which is also like logical because that's why we have financial advisors. 32% uh, uh, could be answered uh, with a generative question uh, directly, and then like 12% uh, would be discarded or uh, wouldn't be answered. So the fun, the good thing is that after annotating manually all these conversations, we had 80% uh, of agreement, which was good to keep going into this so into this uh, validation. Uh, as you can see, the, the um, like the different labels, we got agreement in all of them. So in terms of uh, this question is the context, this one, this one doesn't, etc. So then let's go to correctness. Um, so after we're sure that the, so we, the, the questions can be answered, so how many of them we consider correct? Uh, so we found that for those 32%, 30% uh, could be, uh, well, we consider them correct, which is 9% of the total amount of questions. In terms of those that are, um, that need some context from the, from, from the, from the customer, 44% uh, uh, we consider them correct in order to be suggested to the advisor. So in total, we have like a third of the generated answers are either correct, directly correct, or could be suggested. So these were the like the impact measures that we or metrics that we were uh, looking for. Um, and then, so how do we align automatic metrics uh, with human criteria? So um, in this case, what we did was we took uh, 1,000 questions and answered the, one, the ones that we had annotated and uh, then we got the, um, the metric, the automatic metrics and the values that they gave and what we saw, um, uh, so we tried to correlate it with the human, uh, so the, what? The, 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 oh, the one in the middle. If you look at the, the so Rush one uh, F one, uh, we can see that um, the the correlation is uh, well is the best one because the average uh, don't uh, match. So uh, between true uh, correct and uh, false incorrect. So so we got what we were were getting at. Um, So yes, to some of the results of these uh, findings for our problem, uh, we finally got to uh, understand what the problem, what our problem was that we had underestimated. So the, the problem we were trying to solve was uh, more complex than we thought because we had different nature of questions that could be answered. Um, out of all of them, 33% would be suggested and 9% would be uh, directly used. 
and with this um, um, analysis or on what metric to choose, uh, we got to decide uh, which one as the uh, final ultimate measure. Cool. So uh, to finalize, uh, the key takeaways that we would like to take home are uh, first, <laughs> first is I'll speak. Um, sequence to sequence uh, what? It learns how to generate coherent answers, and this is just the first train that we then we move on. But uh, human evaluation is crucial. Uh, it has been helpful for. Uh, it, has been, it has been helpful for for uh, analyzing uh, aligning with uh, the the automatic methods, but also uh, with the, uh, for for having the total landscape or what can be answered or not. Uh, but manual evaluation is time consuming, so please make sure that you design uh, correctly the, the, and have um, a, a clear guidance on how to how to annotate. Um, also, that uh, <coughs> the definition of coordinates, as we saw, is here in this case specific. Again, pay attention on what is your actual problem, what you mean by correct. And finally, that this as a system could be challenging how to measure the actual impact of this part on a whole, on a bigger system. Right? Uh, but uh, so in general, if you are thinking of using energy methods for for the inputs, so please make sure that you invest some, some time at the beginning on how to design it properly, how you are going to go and write it. Because if not, at the end, you are going to have a very fancy network that spits out the uh, days, months, and how so, but you will have no clue how well or how bad it will be in, well, in real use cases. Um, just a, a few things on future work, uh, as we saw. As we explained, this is in, we did that in part in, in, in this kind of AS horizon three scenario that we run in three months. Uh, the first thing that we are uh, already actually testing uh, here is how do we approach this 55, 56% of the question that we context. And we are uh, using any kind of um, uh, what is called controllable sequence to sequence. The results quite uh, very promising. And uh, in general, uh, uh, another open issue is how do we integrate this proposed system in a bigger system that uh, also takes into account, for example, from the super tribal, when the best, uh, when, when from the all the approaches we have to suggest uh, uh, answers to the manager, which one is the best in any specific case. Right? So, so, how do we mix all together? Um, so, thank you very much for. Uh, your time, not only from Clara and me here, but also for uh, from the rest of the team that have been part of this of this work. Uh, here uh, we are going to, to go to our blog post where we explain this work in more detail. And uh, just to if you are if you just to finish, <laughs> if you have any disability, just to let you know that we are hiring mostly data scientists, but also machine learning engineers. So come to us or go to LinkedIn and let you know. Thank you.